Jason. Thank you. Uh, I am Jason Ritchie, and I am your Democratic candidate for Congress in the 8th Congressional District. I am running against Dave Reichert. He's a Republican. He's been here for 10 years. This will be his sixth time running this really? time. Really? Yep. So, uh, briefly about me. Um, I live in Issaquah. We have uh, my wife Amy's back there. Amy. Uh, we have two kids in Issaquah Public Schools. Um, I'm, a, I'm a dad. <laughs> I'm a husband. Uh, I own a small business, an Issaquah-based small business, construction, accessible construction, wheelchair ramps, lifts, grab bars, it's what I do every day. Uh, was it 2006, my father had a stroke, 2005, right after Charlie was born, my son, my father had a stroke. He went for uh, knee replacement surgery and had a stroke on the table. And they can't give you the clock busters when you have your knees opened up. So he had a significant life-altering stroke. He's a practicing attorney and life changed dramatically. I was a school teacher at the time, training to be a community college history instructor. Loved it. But when you're the firstborn son, your father has a stroke, you go home. You make sure you can help your dad, your mom, make it right. And that's what I did. So my wife, Amy, and I, my firstborn son, Charlie, went back to Michigan to help my father, who was a practicing attorney, to essentially figure out what life was going to be like. And we found out very quickly, first off, that this is before the Affordable Care Act. As soon as you stop paying your bills, you miss that one payment, insurance is done. They tell you you got to go home. Regardless of where you're at, they stabilize you and you're on your way. That was fight number one. Fight number two was Social Security, Disability, Medicare before 65 is not a guarantee. You have to prove it. This earned benefit, you have to prove that you've earned it and that you're eligible and that you should receive your earned benefit. Again, shock to this young man at that time. I couldn't believe that that was what was going on in our country. You don't really realize that until you actually confront that. Third thing was, dad gets discharged, what do we do? We need to make the home accessible for him. So that's what we did. We turned, lemonade, turned lemons into lemonade. We made his home wheelchair accessible. And it was a foundational experience in my life. And I'm extremely grateful for being that, that guy in his life and being able to provide that. And it taught me some very valuable lessons. First off, our government right now the way it's set up, looks at our Social Security and Medicare payments as fungible, things they can spend other things on. Social Security and Medicare are earned benefits. These are not to be privatized. These are not to be played around with. These are earned benefits that you've paid into your whole life, and I've frankly just started to at 43. My opponent thinks that you should privatize Social Security and cut Medicare. No. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. That's not a game. These are people's livelihood. You can't do that. Go on to pay equity for women, another issue. Um, my wife has an advanced degree in uh, library and information science. I have a master's degree in history. It's 2014. We're still talking about equal pay for equal work for women. I cannot believe that's the case, but it is the case every day. And again, my opponent decided to vote against Lily Ledbetter, the law that says if you find out your employer has been cutting or not paying you the same as a man at the, at the same job, the same qualifications, you can't go back and get that money. Lily Ledbetter allows you to do that. That law, it's the first law President Obama signed, his first law in office in 2009. My opponent voted against that law. Pay equity is essential. It is it's a no-brainer to me, but there's still people in the world that think that's, again, something that's up for debate. And my opponent happens to be one of them. It leads me to the government shutdown. Last year, last October, it's about the time I got involved in this race. So the government shutdown happens last year because of politics. Because people think that you can shut down the government because of a disagreement. My little business, my little wheelchair accessible construction business that I started, because of my experience with my father, we rely on the Small Business Administration, the SBA loan program. It's a great program for small businesses. Business and government are not opposed to each other. They're working with each other to help small business owners, businesses like mine. And when the government was shut down last year, my opponent voted for that repeatedly. It stopped access to those small business loans. You don't get to say you're supporting small businesses and small business owners and shut down the government. You can't have it both ways. My opponent wants it both ways. You can't do that. 
the shutdown hurt my business and got me fired up and got me involved in this race. Mm -hmm. Started to find out a couple of things he and I disagree on, and here we are. <laughs> so, I'm running very simply because I believe that there needs to be somebody from the middle class, somebody from my background, my history in Congress. I'm not a wealthy guy. I don't come from the Microsoft millionaire set and that whole thing. I work every day. I still have my business, and it's been a challenge. Thank you, Amy, for supporting me <laughs> through this process. Working every day, running for Congress, it has been an amazingly, it's been a challenge. It's been fun. I love every minute of it, and we've done great things. There is no one else running, my opponent specifically, that works in the private sector, that understands what it takes to create small businesses. Let me give you an example. A uh, conservative idea, Republican idea, here's a $500 tax cut. Go ahead. You've earned this tax cut. Go ahead. It's your money. Go buy a TV. Yeah. Put new tires on your car. Do whatever you want to do. My philosophy is if we all take our $500 tax cut checks, pile them together, let's go build that new road. Let's build that new bridge. Let's build that new school, new internet cables, new anything that puts skilled trades, carpenters, electricians, plumbers to work in our community. They're driving back and forth. They're working in our community. They're spending their money in our community. They're building new infrastructure in our community. And once that's built, that's going to bring in new businesses that want to work around that new infrastructure in our community. That grows our tax base. That grows our communities. That's what's supposed to happen, as far as I'm concerned. That's the old, what happened in the 1930s. That's what we built our, our, our country was based on. The highway system in the 1950s. This is what these major infrastructure reinvestment programs are what built this country. It's time we have to do that again. Last thing I'll add is we have, we have a lot of differences to Congressman Record and I. We have a lot of things we disagree on. and uh, I, It's business. It's not personal. I'm sure he's a very nice guy. One thing he and I disagree on is a debate. I've asked Congressman Riker for three months since the primary to have a debate anytime any place, uh, any issue moderated by anybody, how about right here Providence Point? <laughs> Anytime. He will not debate. He cannot support shutting down the government, which I think is a mistake. He can't support voting against equal pay for women, and he has no jobs plan. And these are things that I hold that's very important and near and dear to my heart, and that's why I'm running to be a representative. Thank you. up for some questions. Yes, sir. We're very fortunate to live in a country where we can listen to and read about the candidates who are going to lead us in state as well as national government. And I'm sad to say that only one person of each one of the candidates, each one of the decisions up here, who has uh, made their presence known. By thinking of uh, uh, Congressman Riker. I have sent him several letters while he's been in office, and each time when I get a reply back, it's not from him, I don't think, but it's from his staff. Never issues that are addressed for what I addressed. Jason, I'd like to know how you would address that issue of getting back to your constituents. After all, we're the ones who put you where you are, hopefully. Thank you. It seems like such a straightforward thing in terms of voter outreach. My, the way I've looked at this thus far is I have opinions, I have ideas, I have beliefs. But I'm not running to impose those on anybody. My role in running for Congress is to make sure that I listen first. And by listening, you learn. And I think when people get in these positions and they're there for a long time, they stop recognizing that they're supposed to represent the people not their own perspective. And I think that changes in terms of people's, they, they've been in there too long. I think that's when you know you've been there too long. In terms of how do you actually respond to a constituent, it seems like that's goal number one. That has to be the first thing you deal with. That's the first thing that's supposed to happen. Something that, you know, in terms of mail back and forth, something that I found kind of challenging is, this is a big district, by the way. I mean, we're in the heart of it right here, right? We have Sammamish and Issaquah. So if you follow that down, we actually have 
while ago, Maple Valley, Covington, Black Diamond, Auburn, all the way down to Enumclaw, Eatonville, Mount Rainier is in the district. And then it goes over the mountains and to include Cleellum, it follows I-90, right? So you got North Bend, Snoqualmie, Cleellum, Ellensburg, Central Washington University, uh, up to Wenatchee, and just north, and including Lake Chelan. It's a huge district, right? And it is a district President Obama won this district in 2012. It's drawn to be a purple district. It's drawn to be competitive. Right? And that, to me, is a good thing. We're supposed to have moderate people making deals and getting things done, moving the ball forward a couple of years. That's, that's the way the process is supposed to work. But more to your point, sir, I think that if we're not, you spend too much time in D.C., you get that kind of, you get that D.C. bug. You start spending too much time back there, you forget that you're supposed to represent the people in this district. Come back home, Congressman. Be here in the district. Have a town hall. Have a forum. Congress record hasn't had a form or an open town hall since 2006. That's a long time. You should be able to be back in the district and answer questions. Respond to mail? Absolutely. But being available for this kind of forum, what else does he have going on? This is what we're supposed to be doing as your elected representatives, being answerable. And if your representative can't come back here and answer questions and stand in front of you until the last person in the room walks out, I don't think they've earned their paycheck. Yes, sir. Uh, Congress is not currently universally loved. <laughs> Understatement. And uh, you're up the new guy, new guy in town. Yes. Have you been given a fair amount of advice as to what to expect before you get chopped up and spit out? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to answer your question. I, and no, and it's a. It's an interesting group of people. I mean, I've, you know, Congresswoman Del Benny, Congressman Smith, Congressman Heck. I mean, uh, we've been endorsed by all the Democrats in the caucus, for sure. My concern here is there's some new people there. I think that's good. And I think as soon as you start to get jaded about what it's your job or step back. You know, get away. If you if you feel yourself getting away from your goal and being there, whatever your goal is, your Republican goal, Democratic goal, your goal in representing people, you got to get out of the way. And you got to bring some... It's, the process is complicated. It's meant to be difficult to move legislation forward. You're, you're pushing against the wind of a, you know, of a constitutional process that's meant to be challenging. And that's a good thing. I don't have a problem with the process. It's the people that get in there, it's about the money. So we've heard a lot, Citizens United yeah. is a topic that's a big deal. I can speak first person to say there is too much money in politics. There need to be publicly funded campaigns where everything is open, and there's 95% of the contributions we receive in this campaign, in my campaign, have been through individual contributions, $25, $5, you know, and up. We've had a couple of unions that have stepped up. I love the fact that individuals care enough about their government to be involved. That's what's supposed to be there. And it's transparent. Not large special interest and political action committees dropping tens of thousands of dollars. A lot of it hidden. That's wrong. I don't care if you're left or right. You can't be hidden. There's too much money in politics. And my experience thus far is that's, that's the problem. That's the virus that's growing in our process. And that has to be stopped. Not sure how to do it yet, but I'm aware of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with that. So does Judy, if she's here. <laughs> okay, any, any one more last question? Well, I'm new in this district, and when I looked at the uh, results from the primary, mm -hmm. I saw that somebody is voting for Reichert. And I am wondering, what are you doing to find out what those people want, how you can represent them so that you can get elected? Yes. And so that means that probably a lot of people in Chelan and Cleo right. are not keen on Lily Ledbetter. That's true. Is uh that's true. There's a, it's a very diverse district. There's, our goal right now has been to focus on getting out the boat, GOTV. So you'll probably be getting some calls from us. We call too much. We know. I'm sorry. We will stop calling. And if you turn in your ballot, the calls stop, whether you're a Republican or Democrat. It's true. There's a system where they, they'll actually, oh, they voted. Your name gets checked off the list. That's a good thing. So um, our goal right now has been to actually get the vote out. And as we're talking about the primary, historically low voter turnout. I mean, put a king hat on me for a day, election holiday. One day every two years, 
where we can all pause. And in this state, we're lucky. We have mail-in ballots. We have two plus weeks to actually get people to actually turn in their ballots. It's a civic obligation. Providence Point, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Dina, the highest voter turnout, the highest precinct turnout in the last two elections, I believe, yeah. or more. But it, I know we were in the 5th District when we were in the 5th, and I, I don't know that a tally has been taken on the 41st, but yes, we were. I mean, I we're. Well, what else? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of our challenge has been, how do you convince people to vote? Oh, it's a bad year for Democrats. Oh, there's nothing. Your my vote doesn't matter. I hear that every day. And all I can tell you is, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy if you don't actually fight against it. Right. Every vote counts, no matter if you're red or blue or independent, doesn't matter. Vote your conscience and get your vote and get your ballot in the mail and get it done, because that's our obligation. It's the one day where all the money in the process doesn't matter because you have a ballot, and that counts more than any money anybody can buy. So it is about voting, and our goal is to make phone calls and do direct voter contact and say, do you know Congressman Riker voted to privatize Social Security? Do you know I'm a small business owner from Issaquah? So there's a lot of getting to know you that way, and it's, it's a challenge. It's been what we've been doing for over a year now, every day, and I love it. It's been exciting, and I'm, I'm having a great time. Okay.